class. Please be quiet. Shh. <laughs> Any special message for all the kids watching at home? Stay out of trouble. Welcome to the RPG Academy Network presents Film Studies. Turn around, look at what you see. Welcome to the RPG Academy Film Studies. I am Kalum, your teacher of foreign cinema. Today, I am going to introduce you to a West German movie, The Unentliche Geschichte, from 1984, also known as The Neverending Story, directed by Wolfgang Peterson, based on the novel by Michael Ende. Tonight, I am joined by the much more musical than me, Senda. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself and your many excellent shows? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I got a lot. I'm Senda Leno. I do the She's a Super Geek podcast, and I also do Panda Stalking Games. I run the Misdirected Mark Network with Chris Nizak, which is an entire network of awesome shows about RPGs. And I write for Gnome Stew, and uh, I've designed some games, and I'm designing some more. <laughs> Does that cover it? I think that's everything. <laughs> Amazing. And we also joined from the other side of the world, literally, by Isham. Hello. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world right now. So what are you uh, all about, Isham? Oh, uh, um, I was saying earlier, we share a passion for Star Wars D6. Yeah, that was my first roleplay game experience, by the way. Me too. So I, I was more of a Star Wars fan, and then I realized role-playing games existed. So I looked around and said, oh, look at that, it's Star Wars RPG, and I grabbed that, and I went on to other RPGs from there. I still need to play with them, but I'm a big fan of your miniatures. Ah, right. I do free Star Wars paper miniatures on my blog. Also, I have a Patreon paper miniature project, which I do miniatures for all the other genres, standard D&D stuff to Lovecraftian 1920s characters and monsters and stuff like that. I'm also a freelance illustrator for a bunch of indie RPGs. We will put links to all of that in the description of the episode. But first, a little content warning or a lack of content warning. Uh, this is a movie for children, so anyone can see it. Although I know the author of the novel was not very satisfied with the very voluptuous description of the Oracle of the South <laughs> or the North. I don't remember. They, they've got a certain charm, I would say. And hopefully ourselves, we won't use explicit language tonight or this morning fine <laughs> <laughs> i'll contain myself what would be each your one sentence review and five star rating for this movie send up oh you want me to start i was just thinking to myself that what i wrote down is probably not actually a good one sentence review of this movie um i adore it that's kind of my one sentence review of this movie i grew up on it and it influenced my fantasy obsession forever and ever and ever, and probably everybody should see it. I give it five stars, although the scripting maybe didn't stand up to growing up, but it doesn't really matter to me. <laughs> One might say you have a never-ending passion for fantasy tanks to this movie. Yes. <laughs> what about you, Isham? My one sentence would be, it's entertaining enough. It's awesome, but it needed more deep Roy. It's a five stars? Yeah, oh, yeah, it's five stars for me. Mine, it's actually a, a paraphrasing from The Simpson. Uh oh. A most excellent but blatant case of fraudulent advertising. <laughs> <laughs> it is that. <laughs> five stars. 
Without further ado, I'm going to have my regular little attempt at painting the whole story of the movie, so spoiler alert for people who didn't see it. Meet Bastian, played by Barrett Oliver. Life isn't great for this 10-year-old and his bowl-cut hairstyle. <laughs> he is raised by a busy widower father and tends to keep to himself. Books are his passion, as they provide the shy boy with an escape from his depressing circumstances. On his way to school, Bastian is teased by bullies. Hey, weirdo. Got any cash for today? After being thrown in a dumpster, he flees and hides in a bookstore he didn't notice before. Mr. Coriander, a grumpy bookseller, who is not played by Dylan Moran, <laughs> is unhappy about the intrusion. <laughs> Bastian notices a rather impressive tome titled The Never-Ending Story and starts questioning the bookseller. But the old man advises Bastian to stay away from it. <laughs> However, an opportune distraction allows Bastian to sneak away with a book while leaving a note promising to return it. Hashtag Team Chaotic Good. <laughs> <laughs> Bastian finds his way to his school's attic. There, he can be alone, start reading, and start his journey into the world of Fantasia. This fairy tale world is slowly being devoured by a malevolent force called the Nothing. Oh no. The childlike ruling Empress has fallen ill. Her condition and the Nothing are apparently linked. Atreyu, a young warrior, played by Noah Attaway, is tasked to find a cure. Atreyu is given a neat medallion named the Orin <laughs> and rides his horse Artax to adventure. Nice horse. It would be a shame if something happened to it. Oh, why would you say that? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the nothing summons a vicious wolf creature named Gmork to kill the young warrior and choose some appropriately branded swamps of sadness, the death of a horse, a giant turtle, a deus ex machina dog-inspired flying luck dragon named Falco, <laughs> gnomes, trials, and some busty southern oracle sphinxes. <laughs> Very busty. I mean, I was looking at the trial, I was thinking, is the trial to stay confident or not to think about <laughs> busty women? <laughs> look, in, look there in the eyes. <laughs> Hey, I'm up here. I am up here. Yeah, look them, look in their eyes, not at their boobs. <laughs> <laughs> All of that is peppered with reaction shots of Bastian <laughs> reading his book, oblivious of time passing. Oh yes, I forgot. One of Atreus' trials included a mirror showing him Bastian. Weird. Hashtag fourth wall break. <laughs> Bastian confused by what he read, I guess. <laughs> I don't think the book included a picture throws the book aside. However, he picks it back later after a while. This is good stuff, am I right? Back to Atreyu. The Southern Oracle tells him it's actually very simple to sort this mess. The only way to save the Empress is to find a human child beyond the boundaries of Fantasia to give her a new name. Okay. Atreyu rides again. Falcor, not the horse. The, the horse is dead, remember? <laughs> just have to keep rubbing that in. <laughs> it's time for a montage as they fly across each and every corner of Fantasia. Meanwhile, Bastion is thinking, watching the sunset. The Empress should be named after my Dizzy's mother. She had a wicked name. <laughs> Fantasia is falling apart. Atreyu is knocked from his flying luck dragon into something called the Sea of Possibilities. Everything seems lost. As Atreyu wakes up on a shore... People are sad with the loss of their friend. But that's not all. Atreyu finds a series of wall paintings describing the previous scenes of the movie. The last one depicts Gomorg, the wolf creature, and... Watch out! He's right behind you, Atreyu! <laughs> Hashtag scary AF. Gmork makes a speech about the nothing being the result of humans not reading enough anymore and only doing selfies and stuff instead. <laughs> Accurate. <laughs> Never mind, it's time for me to kill you. A fight follows, but Atreyu manages to stab the creature to death. Hashtag PG-13. <laughs> Deus Ex Machina Falcor and Atreyu rides again. Everything is gone, but the Empress Ivory Tower, floating on a tiny asteroid in the void of a Bavarian FX studio. <laughs> yeah. Atreyu finds the Empress and apologizes for his failure. But you didn't fail, Atreyu. 
the human child is with you. He has been all along, as well as, quotation mark, others, wink wink fourth wall. <laughs> <laughs> the throne room starts to crumble. The Empress starts addressing Bastion directly. Will you give me a new name or what? No way, replies Bastion, as the storm is raging in the real world. Yes, way, implores the Empress. Okay, Bastion runs. <laughs> Bastion runs to the clashing windows and yells a name in the storm. Moonshine! Silence. Everything is gone, but we'll be born again, thanks to the wishes granted to Bastion. It will be exactly the same as before, actually. I guess Bastion is not very creative. <laughs> Hashtag derivative work. But one more wish. Bastion rides Falker back into the real world to chase his bullies down the streets of Vancouver. The end. Can I tell you, like, a really brief story about this movie? That is a thing that I adored as a child. My grandmother went to London and she brought me back these two leather bookmarks. And one of them is the black bookmark with, um... Oh no! The Queen's Guard with big hats. Big floofy... The word has flown my mind, but... Mine too. It's a black leather bookmark that has a picture of that guy on it, and it is the exact same one that Bastion uses in his book in the morning when he gets up, and I was always thrilled that I had the same bookmark as him. Pretty awesome. That was like my childhood, like... <gasps> <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. So, Senda, would you say that was a moment you liked the most about this movie? Um, No, my favorite part of the movie growing up was definitely Falcor chasing the bullies back down the road at the very end. I, <laughs> I very much enjoyed that as a child. <laughs> yes. I still enjoy it a lot. <laughs> it's funny in my memories. I told Falcor ate them, but th that doesn't happen. But in my memory, it was like that. No, they just screamed <laughs> and like flew. They just <laughs> like, It seems to be flying somewhat slowly. <laughs> yeah. He's not catching up, but I guess it's uh, to scare them even more. He's just flying at the right speed so that they can run away. Yeah, they don't they don't really want to catch them, I don't think. It's just a it's like a dive bomb. Drive by. <laughs> Least favorite moment? Yeah, when um Our tax dies. That part's terrible. <laughs> That's gruesome. It's, it's, it's Literally, I tried to show this movie to my son, and he was loving it until right then. And then he was like, Mom, you have to turn it off. Oh. And he's never finished it because he can't handle the horse dying. So, How old was he at the time? Uh, nine. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, my wife discovered it 10 years ago as an adult, but she grew up around horses. And <laughs> she, yeah, she still tonight, she was, um, yeah, hiding her eyes from the screen because it's a very hard scene. Yeah. Which raises questions. Like, the horse is sad. Okay. It's already rather specific. Right. But Atreus yeah. is not, even when he dies. Oh, no, he is. That's why he's, like, up to his armpits, like, walking along by the time he gets to the giant turtle. What's his name? I don't remember. Seems like he should have been, like, if it takes a minute for our text to be swallowed, then <laughs> then it would have taken, like, five seconds for Atreus to be, like, totally consumed <laughs> by the swamp, judging by his reaction. Yeah, the swamps of sadness move at the speed of plot. <laughs> <laughs> like hyperspace. Yeah. <laughs> I've been reading some trivia, and apparently there's a fake rumor on the internet that the horse actually died during the shooting. It's not true, but the actor almost died during the shooting oh, of the geez. scene. Apparently... He was caught in the sort of elevator, which is underwater, pulled, and he turned unconscious underwater before they, they managed to pull him off. So, oh. oh my! A lot of bad things happened during the shooting. He, he fell from the horse. <laughs> he was walked on by the horse. Oh my gosh! Yeah, bad time for the actor. But uh, yeah, bad times, good times. Isham, what are your favorite and least favorite moment in Never Ending Story? My favorite thing is to see the slice of life kind of thing in any universe. I love it when I see Deep Roy as Teeny Weeny and the rock biter and the, and the stupid bat. You know, they're, <laughs> they're just sitting there and talking about things that's going around. It's like a bunch of... Um, Well, they can either be NPCs, you know, telling the plot to the PCs, or they are themselves PCs in their own adventures, which we have no idea what's going on. We, we just know them in context to the nothing that is coming. But it, it looks like there's a whole other story behind them, which I really want to know. 
I have no idea whether they uh, expanded upon in the books. I've read it. It's been a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't like it as much as the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little dry, and it keeps going into what they turned into the second movie, and so it really fulfills the actual title a little bit more, because he does the thing where he doesn't end at the natural story end point. Right. Which, as a child, expecting something more like the movie, I was like, what have you done? But, you know, maybe I would enjoy it more now. <laughs> we won't go too much in the details of that, but I think you experienced the opposite with The Lord of the Rings. Um, we shouldn't, <laughs> so no, I've we heard. shouldn't even bring it up because this is not a podcast about that. And I, I can fill a podcast with some feels about the movie. <laughs> adaptations of the Lord of the Rings for future reference maybe oh dear but then you would make me watch them again to be able to talk about them and uh, that's no one will watch them with me so anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah so least favorite moment Isham I don't think anyone can substitute the death of Artex yeah. <laughs> with any other scenes in the movie but it's your least favorite moment to the both of you but you would not remove it, would you? No. Oh, no, no, mm -mm. no, yeah, yeah. No, it's integral to the story itself and to making yeah. feelings happen so that we care about what happens in the rest of the story. Exactly. Absolutely. Also, maybe we can weaponize it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> cruel, cruel GMs. Uh, my own favorite bit, first of all, I love the Rock Eater, definitely, but um, taking a slightly different route, it was the first time I saw it in high definition tonight. And I actually really liked the opening, which are practical effects. I don't know if it's with paint and water or something like that, but all across the movie, everything is done with practical effects, with puppets, costumes, the visuals, or even stuff like clouds and things like that. The last scene where Falco shows up to save that for you after the fight with the wolf. All of that I find really, really, uh, really gorgeous. Least favorite moment. It's not something I would remove either, but I'm not, it's a bit weird. The, the acting of Bastian, it's not easy as a character, but I kept thinking that, okay, you're reading a book. You know, I love books. I can be really into it, but I'm not suddenly yelling, oh, yeah, right. I'm having lunch now. <laughs> 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 that, that, yeah. It was a bit obnoxious <laughs> and, and tonight I kept making comments like, what is he actually reading? What is the experience from his point of view? Like, <laughs> what, what's happening? You just read three words describing a young boy, which matches you or maybe the book says, and then he sees you. you. <laughs> you yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking of that. What are the words that he read <laughs> that, you know, confirmed that he was talking to you, Bastia? Did his name come up? Yeah, yeah. Or were there, <laughs> like, words that described him perfectly? <laughs> so, yeah, on one hand, I thought it was a bit heavy-handed. On the other hand, I would not have it any other way because I, I don't see how it could work yeah. in a different way. So, our next question is, would this be a movie you would recommend specifically to the tabletop RPG fans? Oh, of course. I mean, yes. Absolutely. I would say also for me, because I did see it as a kid, like it's been an integral part of how I approach certain types of fantasy. And I think that that's probably true for a lot of English speaking kiddos when it was released, like depending on the age range and stuff. I don't know. It, it definitely had an influence, especially with things like Gamork and Atreyu and stuff. It's part of how we see the fabric of fantasy stories <laughs> happening, right? And it's got the hero's journey, like, down pat. Yeah, I think it's a really useful resource in that aspect. Yeah. I think that it's probably kind of buried in some of the sub-psyche of a lot of the games that we have today anyway, because it was very popular and was a fantasy thing. That's true, yeah. Plus, I think it pulls you in the non-Tolkienesque fantasy yeah. mindset. Yeah. traditional elves and, and dwarves and it's not there but you force yourself to think about what other kind of creatures and 
and races would exist in such places. It's very grand and epic and high fantasy and color. I mean, you don't see uh, mm. spells and magic, but the creatures are so over the top. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not only in their look, but even in their scale. Again, the rock eater is just awesome, his whole concept. Not to mention the background characters mm-hmm. at the tower. Yeah. There's some nice designs there. Yeah. It's kind of a Moses Lee Cantina situation. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, yeah. it is. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> been repeating that several times on my show and even on film studies i really like being told a story and not being told everything you have a window on something which is bigger oh yeah and it's not about closing the loops and telling you the origin story etc from a to b it's about coming back to star wars you are episode four and you have no clue what is episode one two and three your heroes and the world they inhabit already existed before the story was told to you and it will go on after the story is finished. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in media res. Is there a specific tabletop RPG you would feel would be especially appropriate to adapt this movie? So I thought of two, and to me, there's two kind of primary pieces that I associate with this film, and they are the fantasy piece and then the child piece. Because even watching it as an adult, because of the way that they built the world and all of those design things, and because of the main characters that we follow, even through all of the trials and tribulations, there's a certain amount of childlike wonder. There's a certain amount of like childlike reaction, and honestly, sometimes simplicity in the way that everything functions, right? Like, it's a very straightforward story. Yeah, I'm going to have lunch now, too. Yeah, like, woohoo, let's have lunch! (laughs) (laughs) And there's like, oh, I got bullied, I'm going to get back at them! Oh, I got back at them, yay! Like, everything's done, right? (laughs) No, um, so it has some elements that feel very childlike to me in a way that is really fun to play with because it's still fun to build that kind of story, especially against the backdrop that we currently have or, like, have been having, like, of, like, oh, gritty, dark, grim, dark is better, gritty, 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 gritty. And, like, Grimdark doesn't do a lot for me personally, so I'm, like, not really into it. So I'm like, yeah, let's bring some of this back. Okay. So anyway, I came up with um, a couple that I would probably run it in. I'm going to save my favorite one for last, but so the the first one that I thought of was, I think it would actually be pretty easy to hack this into something like Tales from the Loop. And I like it because Tales from the Loop has a very light system, and it already has a bunch of built-in things about being children And that's all the stuff that you could basically take with it. And you could either, you know, you could play with it to pull it in and out of the real world and into Fantasia and back and forth. And I think that it would be super duper cool. It would basically just be pulling that system and mashing a homebrew setting over it, right? But I think that it would work really effectively. I actually really like the idea of taking Tales from the Loop, which is a science fiction. Yeah. And taking the science fiction part and replacing it by a fantasy part. It's a very exciting idea. Yeah, and I think it would work really well for something like a never-ending story kind of thing. Because it also specifically handles some of the parts like he has those scenes with his dad. He has that moment where he decides not to go into class. And like there are real-life things happening around this story. And Tales from the Loop has specific mechanics for basically also forcing you to interact with the normal, quote, adult world, because that's how you recover stress, essentially. You have to go interact with that adult world, and adults are not going to believe you, which is also exactly correct, right? Like, his dad's not going to believe him, like, he can't tell anybody this, right? Well, I'm glad we had this talk, son, you're 10 years old, and... Stop dreaming now. (laughs) Yeah, stop dreaming! (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Go to school, like, you know, it's... It has those parts, so I think that Tales from the Loop would be an interesting way to come at this. And then the other one that I thought of is a lovely Powered by the Apocalypse game called Heroin, which I adore, which is more built to specifically recreate movies like The Labyrinth, stories like Alice in Wonderland that tend to follow a very, like, girl-coming-of-age trope system, because there is a trope system for girl-coming-of-age movies. And stories, cool. Wizard of Oz and stuff. But I think it would be pretty easy to set that kind of story in a never-ending story kind of backdrop. It tends to create the same or similar kinds of fantasy worlds that are very childlike and have a lot of wonder in them. The main character, the heroine, is always someone who is, you know, at oldest a teenager. And basically then you have that main character and then you have a cast of sidekicks, essentially. I can't remember what they're actually called. And that would be, you know, you could fill that in really easily with 
rock biter and like stupid bat characters like <laughs> you could just <laughs> fill that in because that's exactly the kind of characters that those sidekicks are meant to create and then it is built to travel you through a very fantasy fantastical world the same way that fantasia is a really fantastical world so and then in heroin you always save the world and then the question is like do the denizens of that world appreciate that you did that or are they like oh my gosh you destroyed everything get out right so it depends on like how you play it is sort of the key with that one. But I think it would be really interesting to think of heroin through a never ending story lens. I think that would work super duper well too. Um, and I can't re- recommend that game enough. I love it. It's great. Anyway, those are my two thoughts. Those are two amazing suggestions. Sounds very exciting. And Tales from the Loop, I think you could even pull stuff from Simba Room and reuse them directly for your fantasy side of things. But oh, yeah. the coming of age thing is definitely so important in the never ending story. Yeah. Isham, what are your suggestions? I was thinking about using Fantasy Flight Games Genesis. That's a good one. <laughs> There's a lot of situations where they fail at certain things, but they gain, gain something else. You know, For instance, like the Artec, he could have had a failure on one of the axes and had a success on the other axis. So that's why he lost Artex, but he didn't get swallowed by the swamp. Yeah. But, you know, uh, listening to your descriptions of the uh, PBTA and the Tales from the Loop games, I haven't played any of them yet. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're I'd, really good. I highly recommend them. <laughs> if, if I have some extra, you know, cash, I'm going to see if I can get them from somewhere. Are there moments in the movie when you, I guess, any tabletop RPG fan does that? You watch a movie and you look at... Yeah. Barely succeeded that role or oh, critical failure or... Oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> failure. Are there scenes you remember when you could picture Genesis dice rolling in front of you? When Gmort jumped on him, he might have gotten a success with his stab, but he had a Mm -hmm. disadvantage. So, you know, he got mauled a bit and he was bleeding all over. Success with some disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Actually, my own suggestion I had as an RPG maybe to adapt this movie is a game which I haven't played myself, which is No Thank You Evil. Because we've been talking mostly about games in which us adults or maybe teenagers can play children, but No Thank You Evil is a game aimed at having children themselves play a role-playing game. So I don't know if any of you two have any experience with that one. I haven't played it, but I've read it, and um, I did a review for one of the decks of cards that they released after, which was pretty cool. I think it would work pretty well. It creates a little bit lighter of a feel. You're not going to get as intense of a story out of it, probably, because it's just not meant to. But that's like also okay, because you don't have to necessarily do the death of Artax at your table (laughs) with children. (laughs) Like, you don't have to do that to them. It's okay. So, (laughs) but I, I think that you can do that. It definitely has, it has a tone to it that tends to be a little bit lighter, happier, You can definitely have combat, but it also has plenty of focus on finding other solutions for problems because it is for children and like killing things is not the only way that we can solve problems, right? There isn't actually that much killing in uh, a never ending story. Well, no, that's and that's what I mean. Yeah. Except that the nothing just comes in. (laughs) Actually, that's a good segue in the um, what teams ideas from the movie could find applications to tabletop RPG and one to start is it's interesting to see how i don't know stuff i really enjoyed as a child could be quite scary at the same time one of my first memories of being in a cinema was watching snow white and the seven dwarfs and i was scared so much of the witch (laughs) i'm not not sure you would see that in a movie nowadays and and here in the never-ending story there's a bit of violence with Gamork, and Gamork is, is quite scary. Very, yeah. And then again, there's Artax. What do you think of that? To what extent would you consider, quotation marks, scaring children if you would propose a game to some of them? It's kind of tricky, but I also think that as adults, we tend to pretend that children don't want to experience that. One of my favorite authors is Neil Gaiman, and he continuously writes children's books that are really fascinating and really weird and frankly kind of creepy and scary. And he knows it, and he's doing it intentionally, and everybody loves his books, including the children that he's writing them for, right? Child stories are, I mean, all traditional ones 
are all kind of creepy and weird. I, I mean, I'm I'm singing lullabies in French to my son. Mm-hmm. And when you when you listen to the actual yeah. lyrics, you're like, first of all, it doesn't make much sense. Second, you're yeah. like, where does that come from? I mean, I, I, one of the two lullabies I sing is about a lawyer who's going around. He enters a, an inn. He orders some fish, swallows a fish bone, and dies. That's disturbing. <laughs> People are dying. Yeah. <laughs> and that's that French lullaby. Yeah. And the other one is about a guy living in a weird cardboard house the postman comes over and breaks his nose and then it's fixed with golden wire i mean yeah. so these are stuff i used to sing and now i'm singing them to my son but <laughs> they're weird and creepy <laughs> right the one that comes to mind for us is there's a song called ring around the rosie which is about the bubonic plague wow nice <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. like they does it's not in the lyrics. You don't learn that till you're older, but like <laughs> we still teach our children that. So that's why they were sneezing and stuff. Right. Like the reason you'd wear a posy is because of the smell yeah. of your rotting yeah. flesh. <laughs> Pocket full of posy meant you were sick and you were starting to smell like death. Like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> Disturbing. <laughs> so Isham, what's your experience running tabletop RPGs with children? I only run for my son. Yeah, me too. I started running games with him when he was nine years old. Wow, that's great. But before that, we did other things. I just came up with a simple rules like you roll 1d6 and you get 4 and 5, you succeed. And I just drew a map of a cave and he just goes through this and I just narrated to him what happens. I think I played with him then when he was like 6 or 7 years old. But the first thing I ran for him was Star Wars D6. Yeah. For obvious reasons. <laughs> Plus, he was watching The Clone Wars a lot. So, there are a lot of things that he understands. So, there's not a lot of horror there. But the second game I ran for him was Micro Light 20. And I ran a zombie game for him. Mm-hmm. It was a single player one shot. But the zombie game, that sounds kind of scary. I don't think he scares easy. <laughs> My son, on his own, not with any prompting from me, he grew up like a, like a horror fan film or something. And so it's very difficult for me to come up with things that scare him on a <laughs> existential level. <laughs> I throw a ghost at him and say, yeah, it's a ghost, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there is a lot of that. <laughs> yeah. My son has an obsession with mythical creatures and supernatural things right now, which I totally remember because I went through that too. Uh And I would read up on everything, even though it all scared me, I was fascinated by it. And he's in that same place (laughs) where like ghosts are really scary, but he also can't stop consuming literature and like everything about ghosts, all of that kind of stuff. So he's checking out books about weird phenomena from the library and all these things. Yeah, that's awesome. There's a certain age, I think, that I won't say all, but I think a lot of kids go through a certain age where they kind of like scaring themselves to a certain extent. Yeah, right. I haven't seen it really truly happen at the table because the fact of the matter is I'm his mom and I'm sitting there. There's nothing that's really gonna... (laughs) He might not like something that happens. You know, he might have a different reaction. Like if I did Artax, he would be like, no, I can't take it, right? But He's not scared. Yeah, even if I describe Gamork or something along those lines happening, he's going to be like, whoa, that's crazy, like, cool. And like, whoa, like, super big action eyes, but it's not going to scare him at the table. I actually ran a five-episode campaign for my son of Call of Thulu. Oh. oh, wow. Yeah. When he was 11. So I, I like to tell people that the whole building fell on my son when he was 11. And, uh, and I said, what? And I know I was playing Call of Duty at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he died in the fifth episode. And that was really horrible because what happened was this. Some cultist was trying to bring Tulu out in San Francisco and... He tried to save someone from being sacrificed, and if he saved it, then he would stop it. However, on the way, he fumbled a lot of driving checks. So what happened was there was an earthquake in San Francisco, and he crashed his car. And in the meantime, zombies were coming out all over the place. You know, all over the city was being infested by zombies, and he got paralyzed from the waist down because of the crash. And he was crawling out of the car, and he saw. Thulu rise up from the bay and then zombies came and he saw that and I told him this the zombies are eating you from your waist down and you don't feel it and he's like oh okay yeah sure <laughs> <laughs> dramatically he gets the point you know he's like wow it's, a, it's an awesome ending it's not the ending that he w- he'd wish for but he wasn't really scared of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah how old was he? 11 11 wow 
my son is uh, not even nine months old oh, yet. It's hard to envision yet then. <laughs> I'm sorry, I started playing with him when he was 11, but the fifth episode, because we played every half a year or something like that, was when he was 13. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay, man. And it's zombies so are eating me. Like, wow, I'm paralyzed, don't I? <laughs> That's super cool. But uh, yeah, would the two of you have uh, advice for me and listeners about what to think about when you are running for young children? What are things that one might not think of? To me, the key difference is that you have to remember to a certain extent, especially for things that tend to be more story-based games, kiddos are still learning how to share depending on how old they are when you play with them. Yeah, that's right. And they are also still learning how to enjoy things like failure. So that kind of stuff where like, At a table full of adults, heck, most of the time when I'm playing, if I have a choice to pick between like paying something and getting a success or getting a partial success or a success with complication or something like that, I'm always going to take the complication or I'm going to take the failure or yes, I'm going to take that fate point because I really, really, really want to play my flaw. Like, please let me because those things to me make story really, really interesting. I think that that is something that we learn as we get older in terms of what's the word that I'm looking for? I'm not quite sure. Basically, it's a maybe maturing of level of complication of story. I think in a way, I don't mean that that's something everybody needs to achieve or whatever, but I would consider that already an advanced player approach because myself, I'm not sure I did that until recently. And depending of my circumstances during the day at work, etc. Some evenings, I will embrace it uh, more or less. I know other players who don't. It depends. Yeah, it depends a lot. I think too on the game that you're actually playing, right, and who you're playing with, right? Yeah, and those things are fine. But I do think that you get into a situation with kiddos, and it is definitely. Here's what I should actually say. The story itself is rarely going to be their first priority. Mm -hmm. Their first priority is going to be their character. And that's totally fine. And it's totally fine to play games like that, too. Yeah, of course. But it's something that you want to consider when you pick what game you're going to play and how you're going to run it and how many of them you're going to let sit at the table because they are probably all (laughs) going to want to do different things. Oh, yeah. Um, Because, like, three can be a lot when they're all ten and they all want to run off and do a billion different things, like, that's a hard game to run, and it takes a lot of energy for me to run it the one time a year that I agree to do it, right? (laughs) Um, So I think it's that, where, like, without trying, they can be difficult adult players. (laughs) Right, right. But you just have to acknowledge that that's just how kids play. And that's how they play in the playground, too, right? Like, they're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and they're all playing together together. But they're not necessarily building a story together. They sort of are, but it's also slightly competitive. Right, yeah. The other thing that we can do is we devise encounters around something that wouldn't take a lot of attention. Yeah. (laughs) Playing for shorter periods of time helps a lot. Yeah. So instead of something with a lot of backstory, you know, like before you get the quarter of the backstory, they're all like all over the place already. They they won't. So whatever is in front of their eyes, their character's eyes, you just describe it. And if there's a conflict or a problem for them to surmount, it should be right there in front of them. Mm -hmm. You should be able to describe it in one or two sentences and say, okay, now what do you do? Yeah. So depending also on the age of the kids that you're playing with is... Yeah, exactly. Be super obvious and know that for younger children, you're probably not going to play for longer than an hour. Exactly, yeah. And then you can get up to two hours. I still don't run a game longer than an hour or two for my son. That's about his attention span, you know. (laughs) And then he wants to go play on his iPad. Like, this is the age that we live in. <laughs> Mom is only entertaining for so long. Same here, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Did your children came to you asking for role-playing games, or did you present them to them, or, or did that happen? My son has always, like, ever since he was old enough to kind of hear what was going on, I mean, he's always asked me to. So I think I did something pretty similar to what Hisham was doing. 
I think when he was five or six, I was using some super simplified D and D, like roll a D twenty, and if it's over a ten, you win. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, we were setting up dungeons like with his blocks and like little you know toy figures and stuff. So he was having lots of fun with that, and I, and it was like half an hour at that point. Now he's at the point where he asked me to run actual D&D for his last birthday party. And I ran it for him another time, too, which is really funny because I'm like not actually a D&D DM like at all. <laughs> um, but that's what he wanted. And so I did it. Did you try to be, oh, well, actually, I could run Dungeon World or Heroin. Instead. I really did. I really tried. Actually, it was really funny. What happened was he decided that he really wanted to keep playing that game. And they were off at recess every day, him and his friends playing what they were calling D&D, which was basically just playing those same characters and playing their story out. And none of them have any like real background in it or anything. And it doesn't matter. But I handed him the monster manual, right? And I printed him out the really simplified quick start guide. That is awesome. So I just sent him to school with a folder of D&D stuff. And the next thing I know, his after school care, he's been like running D&D for kids. Wow. But the funny part about this, it was great. I don't know what he did. Like, I have no idea if he did the actual rules or whatever. Like I said, it totally doesn't even matter. My son has already <laughs> DM'd games and I'm really proud of him. And he's been working on writing a Minecraft adaptation of D&D 5th edition. Like, I'm like, okay, child, you go. <laughs> Yikes. That's a heartbreaker waiting to happen right there. But I support you all the way. But the really funny thing that happened is he tried to run it at recess. Um, oh my God. And there's a different oh principal no. now at his school, but the principal at his school last year was like, that's too violent. You can't play D&D &D at recess. And I was like super offended when he came home and told me that his principal wouldn't let him run D&D &D at recess because I think that role-playing games in general are such a wonderful yes. tool for children to explore play that also has rules and basically working within that and learning about working together and all of those things and also math, woohoo, and all of that stuff all mushed together. So I was really offended that the principal told him that D&D &D was too violent. I was like, <laughs> excuse you, I'm going to go find all the resources that I know exist on the internet about how good this is for children <laughs> and whatever. But uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem this year. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to go burn down the doors, but I was close. <laughs> In a couple of years, one of those resources will probably be mine. I'm working on my master's degree. The topic is using tabletop RPGs as a learning tool for English language teaching for ESL students. That's amazing and fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. In my last meeting with my supervisor, she was like, holy crap, we can write a lot of books on this. Yeah. And we're going to test it out <laughs> on my own staff. Yeah. I said, well, yeah, sure. All right, let's man. do it. Just call me. I'll bring the dice and the rules. <laughs> You just bring the pencils and the papers. That's awesome. <laughs> so what about you? Or did you introduce tabletop RPGs to your children? After he was born, until more or less 10 years after that, I didn't really have anyone to play with. Ah, recruitment. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I was in like a desert of role-playing games. The Call of the Lubo was a gift from Gary Esselford. He worked on a bunch of Wizards of the Coast stuff, and he also has a credit on Age of Rebellion for Fantasy Flight games and a bunch of Age of the Empire stuff. So he gave it to me right around the time when my son was born. And he says, if you don't have anybody to play with, read your own players. True facts. I think it was figurative. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, I took that literally. <laughs> no, no, it was literal. <laughs> yeah, the literal. And every time I play with my son, I do a blog post on the actual play report. So I actually credit him. Ten years ago, you gave me this book. <laughs> and now I'm playing it with my son. <laughs> grow your own. Yeah, grow your own players. Since then, when I was living in Kuala Lumpur, I got my own group. I GM for them a bunch of Star Wars. And I played Eclipse Face and Night's Black Agents and Doctor Who with them. But now I've moved away, so I'm GMing people who fell into, I mean, they weren't prepared for this, so these guys are my students. <laughs> I teach English now. When I'm done with, with my syllabus and I have an extra couple of hours or something, and I say, okay, we're playing role-playing games. So far, it's been great. They love it. But the only thing is that I can't play with the same group for a long time. So these kids, I can't really measure the improvement in language. 
when I start my masters, I will have to find a proper group, and I probably find some group between thirteen and sixteen mm-hmm. in a school. I'm going to measure how they level up with their speaking skills and their problem solving skills and all that, and that will be something to talk about later, I guess. Yeah, tabletop RPG. There's a number of qualities and abilities in real life which you can develop with tabletop RPG. There's not that many hobbies. Oh yeah, that's true. Where you can develop so many things. Coming back to what you were saying, Senda, the ability to um, find enjoyment in a form of failure. If I was trying to think of something like that, I, I don't know. I guess in sports, to some extent, you can, but uh, even so. Uh, Working together, uh, problem solving, investigation, reading people's motives and reacting to that. Of course, that's not something you do uh, starting age 10, but still, there's a lot of stuff you can learn through tabletop RPGs. If I continue to bury us down this rabbit hole a little bit further, learning through RPGs and the different ways that we can do that, continuing that into whatever people are kind of up to learn and how far they're willing to push it is a lot of what I'm designing into a lot of my games right now. So the the game that I'm going to be taking to Kickstarter in the spring of this coming year, 2019, is called Turning Point. And one of the things that it does brilliantly give us the chance to emotionally and empathetically connect with someone who's making a really difficult decision that we may have never have made ourselves personally. Great. That is awesome. Yeah, you get to like, so if I use learn, I mean, that's a, it's sort of, I don't feel like that encompasses it, but it, it's our opportunity to practice also in social ways. So not just language, not just problem solving, not just math. It gives us the opportunity to practice social skills and yeah. even practice emotional skills, which are usually things that we just get dumped into society and then everybody's like, well, you should just know how to do this. And the fact of the matter is that The first time that you confront something, you may not know how to handle it. You may not know how to do it or like whatever it is. So I love taking games and pushing them. Not like all of my games are crazy like this, but, you know, creating spaces in which you can explore and experiment with some of that stuff to see, like, what does it feel like to be in this situation that I have not been in and may never be in. Right. And that's fine. And like, you don't ever have to be in it. But the more we have empathy for each other as humans the better off everything will be. I say this as a person living in the United States right now, and I'm very aware of that fact. Um, ah. (laughs) (laughs) We'll just leave that right there. (laughs) But I think that, you know, the more that we empathize with everyone else on the planet and have some sort of at least bare level of sympathy for everyone's situation and being able to treat everyone as people... (laughs) And understand that everybody goes through hard things and we may not necessarily connect with that. Yeah. That's a learning experience that I don't know how you can really create that without either happening to someone in real life or you can do like a game like this. You have to have some method for kind of living through it to learn that stuff. Anyway, so I am a strong <laughs> believer in the power of RPGs to teach us things in all sorts of ways and all sorts of methods For children, they're fantastic and great. And they also teach emotional coping skills. But don't play Turning Point with children. (laughs) (laughs) But you know what? We might be able to scale that for younger children to be able to understand and deal with emotions that the younger children go through. Yeah. I mean, it could still be. Yeah. How I advocated this to my supervisor was that role-playing games are something that a lot of people haven't really known about. Yeah. It's pretty niched. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something that, as a tool for teaching and learning, it's unbelievably awesome. It puts you in a situation where you can learn anything from maths to emotional skills. So if it works in that way, why don't we have some sort of a... We codify it and put it in schools, you know? Yeah, I'm with you. (laughs) Yeah, and and to do that, we need researchers to come up with the numbers Yeah, to show people that it works. Yeah. I'm trying to teach a language. So language, we can use fate because fate has, you know, the... Oh, yeah, it's good. When you understand the phrase and you can use the phrase in any situation and which can be awesome to teach kids as well. Yeah. You know, anybody who's trying to learn English, one. And two, you can teach emotions. Yeah. My son went through his first death 
playing Bare Bones Fantasy. Yeah. He really loved that character that, that he made, but, you know, uh, he got fried using the Sword of Star Spark, <laughs> <laughs> which amplified his lightning magic, killing off a monster, but also fried him and he died. But I think he learned from it, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't get choked up about it, but he knew that it was a dramatic point yeah. in the game, but he didn't take it personally. And that's just death. I mean, you're not really going to mm -hmm. die every day, you know. Uh, but what if you're bullied in the classroom? Yeah. What if you feel slighted towards a teacher who doesn't understand you? We can put this in a game and we can get the kids to understand it more. You know? But overall, the entire thing is tied in a long-form narrative. And that's what makes people keep on playing. They want to know what happens next. And while they want to see what happens to their characters, what happens to their friends' characters, what happens to the entire world, they pick up things, they learn things as they go along. And if we can put all of that in a book, show the people the numbers, I think a lot of schools will use RPGs in classrooms officially. Mm -hmm. What's interesting with role-playing games is that there's sort of a paradox. You said two things. On one hand, you said it's very niche. Most people don't know about it. Yeah. And you talked about codifying something. And actually, role-playing games, it's something everyone did as a kid, but in a non-codified yeah. version yeah. of very likely codified way, which is just agreements of, I wave my hand at you in a specific way. And I say, pew, pew, and that means I right. shot you, and it was in your direction, so you need to pretend that you were shot, and so on. What's not there is the randomizer, a ruling system, not, not ruling in terms of just mechanics, but ruling situation, saying, okay, indeed, you shot me, or I didn't, so ensues children argument of, no, you didn't shoot me because X or Y. I mean, I played. Star Wars like that. Uh, I was playing, uh, you know, uh, in my uh, neighborhood street, we would play Star Wars and running around all the time. And it's much later that I happen on a book of Star Wars, the role-playing game by Western Games, which then had codes. Right, yeah. So on one hand, it's very niche. On the other hand, it's something everybody did. But it's about how do you make the codification of it to create that added value of uh, narrative, concentrating on specific things you want to teach. We're talking about emotion, etc., which are, are stuff I very deeply believe in. But even if I was engaging with a neoliberal individual business runner, I could tell them about how a game like Legend of the Five Rings taught me about corporate situations, you know, big organizations, right. people being in positions of leadership, of power, and having to make decisions and being under those people and or do you interact and you engage with others like that and understanding situations of, oh, I'm in charge of this. Yeah, it's emotional, it's societal, it's all of that. And uh, there's so many specific stuff you can learn in a unique way in, in tabletop RPG. And I, I think when you see countries like Scandinavia, which are often ahead in a bunch of things, they got role-playing schools nowadays and uh, it makes perfect sense, actually. <laughs> Anyway, it's quite late. Uh, is there, <laughs> yeah, thanks for staying up. <laughs> is there anything, teams or ideas in Neverending Story, which uh, you are desperate to talk about before we part way, sadly, this morning to nine this afternoon, depending on your time zone? <laughs> Very much talk about children in RPGs. I think we covered that one very thoroughly. <laughs> if really we want, we could talk about breaking the fourth wall. Oh, you know what? I actually came up with something like that once, but it's not players breaking the fourth wall. An idea in D&D, &D, they have a quest, and at the end of the quest, the treasure was the PCs goes into a room, and they meet the GM. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I didn't run it, but I heard a friend of mine tried it, and I, I think he didn't like what happened because. Yeah. <laughs> can I have a. Uh, yeah, sure. Can I have a. Uh, yeah, no. Now you got like, a bunch of all powered PCs. <laughs> yep. My life is meaningless. <laughs> yeah. I'm just the avatar of someone. <laughs> yeah, so that's the only time I ever thought about breaking the fourth wall. To me, I can see breaking the fourth wall within a game. As in, like, you could have a moment where your PCs maybe see a window into the real world, which would be a very never-ending story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that it would work for me to actually try and incorporate 
the player and the player character in such a meta way, because once it's you personally starting to have to make decisions and interact, it kind of stops being a story and stops being a game yeah, yeah. and starts being like a you real time social interaction, which is different. It's not that it's bad. It's not what I'm playing games for. Yeah. It's a very 80s trope to do things like, you know, pretend it's fantasy, but really it's sci-fi. In Numenera and stuff, you can do things like, ooh, this crazy theater-looking thing, but it's got a big glowing square and there's moving pictures on it. So you can do weird, like, meta. I'm describing this like you don't know what it is, but it's a movie theater, right? But, like, it's Numenera. <laughs> Everything is magic until you can find a rational explanation. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can do it in subtle ways as well as very direct ones. I don't know of a game that I would necessarily use to do it really specifically, like, to the actual players themselves. I haven't run it yet, but the game I'm planning to run in the near future is inspired by Sword Art Online. But it's not exactly the fourth wall. It's, uh, I don't know what you call that in English, a uh, mise en abîme, because it's a story within a story. So players, they're going to play their character as Japanese high school students. Ooh. And in parallel, yeah, yeah. they're going to play... A video game yeah. in which they play a medieval fantasy thing. So there will be things like menus, you know, yep. uh, user interface, this sort of things, I, I, uh, yeah. healing bars. There's a new game which I have not tried. It's called, is it a plane? Which is a sort of a meeting point between Pictionary and a role playing game. You don't roll, you draw. <laughs> And you draw into the frame of a comic book. So as you play along, you draw a comic book. So you pick the size of your frame and together they create a page. And the bigger the frame, the more powerful your action. But what you do is you, you draw something very fast. And the game master then interprets what he sees on the drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's amazing. I need to play that game. So I guess in there, you could have breaking the fourth wall in the sense, well, you, you got a comic book in front of you. It's, <laughs> it's sort of very express, even without playing a Deadpool character as well. Like, wait, wait, wait a minute. We are in a right, yeah. Jack Kirby uh, nine frame panel. So we need to do things a certain way. I will say I have one last comment and then I will be done because it's very late for you. <laughs> there is one thing that I use very frequently as a GM tool. And I think that a lot of other people do too which is that we tend to specifically cinematically describe scenes. So I will literally say things like, you see a forest and the sun is rising and the camera pans across as a bird flies or whatever, right? As if we're watching this, even though we're not watching it, we're just imagining it. But it gives us a frame of reference yeah. about what we would kind of see if this was a story or the opening of a book or the scene in a movie. And that's like a tiny little meta fourth wall thing, because of course, there's no actual camera here. <laughs> Actually, that reminds me of something I've heard of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer role playing game. Yeah. yeah. And apparently you've got sections of sponsors. I haven't played this stuff. I've been told about the game. So your character will be more or less popular with the audience. Yeah. You've got the fourth wall that you know you are in a TV show and there will be even stuff like product placements. So you, you, you will describe. You make me realize that I said all that stuff about the fourth wall, but have you played katanas and trench coats? No. So katanas and trench coats is specifically built that you are playing that kind of really angsty CW teen drama with supernatural weird stuff. No. <laughs> it's fantastic. It was written by an awesome gentleman named Ryan Macklin, and he's uh, working on the second edition right now. It kickstarted last year, I think. It's amazing because you have these supernatural beings, but you're playing on a giant stage for the darkest cosmos, who is your audience. So it is literally a television show, but your goal as a character is to have all of this angst because that is what the darkest cosmos likes to see, <laughs> right? So the more angst you have, the more the darkest cosmos is enjoying the show. And the more that they, like, feed you things and stuff, the Darkest Cosmos <laughs> is both embodied and played by the GM of the game, but, of course, is not actually the GM of the game, so the GM can't be blamed for anything that happens. It's the fault of the Darkest Cosmos. They are simply channeling it. It's truly amazing. I would highly recommend it, and it's very irreverent and self-aware. <laughs> so that might be one. 
which indie game was a bit uh, like that where you had uh, oh, yeah. just the problem is when I, I hear about all these games second hand and I haven't played them myself <laughs> it's difficult but stuff it's much easier to remember the ones that you've played yeah th there's one which uh, was very pulpy like an old movie and you could have um, yeah shots oh and this... action movie world is it that one it's not that one but this one uh, yeah I've heard oh. also about it but Action Movie World also does it because you create two characters. You create an actor, and then you create their role in the movie. And if you play a campaign, you continue to play the same actor, but you'll play different roles in different movies. Each movie is like a one-shot game. It's amazing because you then are also playing the actor outside of the scenes, except we don't see those shots. <laughs> you only see the shots of the movie. And I, I, when I have played this game with certain people <laughs> their actor persona did shows like shakespeare on the grand stage and all this stuff but they get stuck playing these people who have terrible lines and they're like i can't believe i have to say this i'll be in my trailer like you know <laughs> but like in the middle of the movie it's amazing anyway sorry all this fourth wall stuff <laughs> We were going to wrap this up because it's so late for you. <laughs> uh, don't, don't worry about me. I'm more concerned about where about you. you have to go. Uh, anyway, tomorrow morning, I'm in a swimming pool with my son. So uh, it's going to wake me up anyway. <laughs> Isham, anything to add on the subject of Fort Wall? I have something to say in terms of the never ending story itself. Only recently did I know that Bastian yelled moon child. Yeah, it's really hard to understand him, isn't it? Yeah, you know. <laughs> It's, until ooh, until we have yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you know that's it. <laughs> and then, yeah <laughs> once we had home theater and subtitles and oh that's what he was okay wait his mother's name is Moonchild yeah she was a hippie <laughs> <laughs> do you think she was Native American and that's why he's got the Native American character on his bag hey, and I haven't, that's yeah. where Atreyu comes from. I mean, There's so many the thing rumors. Is, I, I saw <laughs> it. Today was the first time I saw it in English. Ah. And before watching it, I wrote the summary uh, using a, a Wikipedia article. The name Moonchild was mentioned in there. Uh, so when I saw the movie in English today, I knew he was saying Moonchild. Reading a bit of trivia, it was made on purpose that it was difficult to tell what he was actually saying. I see. I find it quite cool so people can picture whatever name they have in mind. And I wonder to what extent the movie encourages viewers themselves to yell a name. Oh. But the thing is, in French, he yells a different name. Interesting. He yells Karina. Oh, really? And, yeah. How does it match the, the words of the mouth? He's like, Karina! <laughs> oh, there's the storm. You, you cannot read. I think he was saying Karina. That's how I remember it. But uh, right, right. he's certainly not saying it. Le Moon Child. <laughs> <laughs> On that, I think we're going to close. Thank you, class, for your participation today. Thanks to the listener for joining us again. You can find the RPG Academy on Twitter at the RPG Academy. And all our various shows are on... Uh, Podcatcher, iTunes, etc. You can check the website of the RPG Academy. Please consider supporting the RPG Academy and maybe my own show, The Release Podcast, via Patreon. We do this out of our passion for the hobby, but we do have some expenses. And uh, having your support is a big encouragement and allows us to pursue more projects. Isham, could you plug again your work and tell people where they could find you? You can find me on my website, www.hishgraphics.com. Hish Graphics is also my Twitter handle and also my Instagram handle. I don't do as much anymore uh, of the freelance illustration because I'm teaching, but I still do once in a while. I can also be found on Patreon, Hish Graphics, for my RPG paper minis, small ones. Nice. Not big ones. Senda, where can people find you? Lots and lots of places. So you can find me on my podcast, She's a Super Geek, which you can get at sassgeek.com or anywhere you like to get podcasts. She's a rock <laughs> and roll baby. Yeah, like that. <laughs> you can find me also on Pandas Talking Games on the Misdirected Mark Network, which is misdirectedmark.com or at Pandas Talk Games on Twitter. And Sasky, at Sasky Podcast is the one I forgot to say. Which reminds me, Pandas Talking Game, croissants are not a type of bread. 
<laughs> Did we say that they were a type of bread? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> for an argument if they were great bread. No, they're not because they're not bread. <laughs> anyway, sorry for the interruption. It's okay. Every time we bring up something French in a stupid American way, you just let us know because we're just dumb about it. <laughs> They're a bakery item, at least. Um, oh, yeah, the, the big goods, for sure, but they're not bread. <laughs> I like to put sandwiches on them, though. Anyway, <laughs> I will stop defending <laughs> croissant. And uh, you can find me on Gnome Stew, which is at Gnome Stew on Twitter or GnomeStew.com. And I have an article up there usually about once a month. And you can find me personally on Twitter to follow me for crazy games and what I ate for dinner and all of those weird things, my fluffy skirts, um, at Idella Mithland, which I know is completely unspellable. It is I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D. And if you find me, I'm very proud of you and I'll give you all A pluses. You can add an A plus easily by just checking the description of this episode because that will include right. the <laughs> I was just about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great. Anyway, thank you, everyone. See you for the next movie, which I think should be returned to us, which was supposed to come out before this one and the one before but uh danny is running into some difficulties to gather people so yeah return to us i think it will be coming after this one 